Well, good day to everyone joining us and welcome to today's X Talks webinar. Today's talk is entitled Building a Bioanalytical Strategy for Asset Optimization and Risk Management in Drug Development. My name is Ryan Muse and I'll be your X Talks host for today. Today's webinar will run for approximately 60 minutes, and this presentation includes a Q&A session with our speakers. Now, the webinar is designed to be interactive, and webinars work best when you're involved. So please feel free to submit your questions and comments for our speakers throughout the presentation using the questions chat box, and we'll try to attend to your questions during the Q&A session. This chat box is located in the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and if you require any assistance along the way, please contact me at any time by sending a message using the same chat panel. At this time, know that all participants are in listen-only mode, and please note that the event will be recorded and made available for streaming on xtalks.com. At this point, I'd like to thank Mercodia, who developed the content for this presentation. Mercodia specializes in bioanalytical solutions for preclinical and clinical development, leveraging their 30 years of experience in developing ligand binding assays and offering an ever-expanding portfolio of over 500 biomarkers. Combining the agility of a small company with the expertise of a large one, they ensure the best value by understanding a project's needs from an early stage, providing cost-effective solutions. They have bioanalytical capabilities in Sweden and the US and are GLP certified and conform to guidelines from the EMA and the FDA. Their on-demand service grants easy access to their expert team with rapid turnaround times and reliable data. Now I would like to introduce our speakers for today's event. Dr. Carmen Herrera Hidalgo leads strategy, portfolio management, quality and customer satisfaction at Mercodia Bioanalytical uh, Services. With diverse experience in life science B2B service and startup sectors, she is a skilled in product development, preclinical efficacy evaluation, and scientific strategy. Carmen has over 10 years of research experience in physiology, immunology, diabetes, and oncology, and holds a PhD in physiology and immunology from Uppsala University, Sweden. Dr. Tanya Yarhade holds a PhD in biochemistry and has over 20 years experience in developing fit-for-purpose linked binding assays for bioanalysis. In her current role, she oversees tailoring bioanalytical strategies for customer projects. Tanya has a background as a scientist at Biocore and extensive expertise in assay validation and understanding regulatory guidelines from FDA, EMA, ICH, and CPAP. And Dr. Gianni Garcia Feraldi is involved in product development and proof of concept for new technologies at Mercodia. He holds a PhD in cellular and molecular biology and has over 20 years experience in research in academia and industry with extensive, extensive knowledge in upstream and downstream processes. Gianni has worked with various molecules and methods including mass spectrometry, HPLC, cytometry, microscopy, and SEC. But without further ado, let's go ahead and hand things over to our speakers for today. Uh, Carmen, you may begin when you're ready. So hi, Ryan, and thank you very much for a nice introduction to us. And I would also like to thank you in the audience for being here today. We're very excited to be here today and talk about how to build bioanalytical strategies for asset optimization and risk management uh, in the drug development process. So I am thinking that perhaps you in the audience know that drug development is high cost and high risk endeavor and biomarkers and PKD play key roles in the drug development process because they have the potential to improve the success rate and reduce the uncertainty in decision making. So by building a well-built fit for purpose biological strategy, the aim is to reduce, reduce risk and optimize assets throughout this process. Uh, we're going to learn today key elements to consider when designing a bioanalytical strategy and also how to ensure that reliable data is obtained at all phases for different intended uses. But before continuing to our, with our presentation, we would like to ask uh, Paul questions about your concerns in bioanalysis. So Ryan, if you Yes, thank you so much. So appearing on everyone's screen at this time is a polling question. You can select on multiple answers that you see and then click submit to participate. 
The question that we're asking is, what are your concerns when outsourcing your bioanalysis? Your answer options are time or delivery time, price, trust, true understanding of your project needs, or difficulty finding the right partner. Give everyone some time to consider the answer. Again, you can select multiple ones that apply to you and your situation and then click submit. And the question again is, what are your concerns when outsourcing your bioanalysis? Looks like we have the majority of answers in, so thank you very much for participating. Let's look at our results here. We have a time uh, for at 73%, and then next up is true understanding of the project and needs at 64%, then trust for 45% of you, and then price for 36% of you, and then 9% of you selected difficulty. Uh, so thank you again so much for participating, and now it's back to you, Carmen. Yes, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Yes. Oh, great. So it's very interesting to get this variety of answers, and we hope that we address your concerns here today through this uh, webinar. But I want to introduce first Mercoya to you. We are a trusted supplier of bioanalytical services and immunoassays. We have been developing, manufacturing, and distributing high quality ELISAs, immunoassays, for over 30 years. And we use this expertise in our on-demand bioanalytical services, in which we offer easy access to our expert team, and this gives turn, rapid turnaround times and data you can trust. We have an ever-expanding portfolio with over 500 biomarkers. We are GLP certified and have customers in over 80 countries. Mm -hmm. So more specifically about our bioanalytical services, what do we do? We design pre-purpose assay development and bioanalytical services for preclinical and clinical development. A typical, our customers are in pharma, biotech, and the CRO space. And we are specialized, but not limited to large molecules, peptides, and oligonucleotides. We offer a broad service portfolio, and we use different core platforms as ELISA, Mesoscale, Discovery, and Biocore, but expand over this through partnerships as well. And biomarker-driven drug development is the norm today and have the potential to make drug discovery, development, and approval processes more efficient while improving patient outcomes. And this is the reason why biomarkers today are used for decision-making throughout the entire drug development pipeline with different purposes. And this can be from defining the mode of action, efficacy and safety of a drug candidate, but also to patient certification and evaluation of clinical trial endpoints. This is why designing a fit for purpose bioanalytical strategy is essential to guarantee that reliable data is obtained at the right time throughout the whole pipeline and this way reduce risk and costs. But how to ensure that a fitful purpose bioanalytical strategy is built, right? That is often the challenge. And today, pharma companies focus on assembling high competence in drug development and instead involve an external partner, an expert partner, for the development and validation of bioanalytical methods and also the bioanalysis itself. Uh, it's always most effective, of course, to initiate the partnership early and work as colleagues so the bioanalytical lab can, can have detailed information and can have a deep understanding of the intended use of the data, the context of use, and define the most effective fit for purpose strategy. Depending on the project, there are several things to consider, as you can see in this slide. From uh, understanding the intended use of the data, for example, if it's going to be used for preclinical GLP or not, that's important. The type of analyte and presence of, for example, uh, homologous counterparts, but also to study design, among other things, number of samples and time uh, of, the, of, the, of the project is also important to be considered. We often ask, how good must the assay be, right? That is an important question that everyone has. And we 
usually answer the same thing, that there's not such a thing as a good or, or, or a bad assay. Um, but what matters is that the context of use is understood. So we have here an example to, to uh, delineate this. And it's, uh, we can, um, we have, can be requested uh, an assay to measure a biomarker that uh, measures changes in response to a disease or a treatment. And we're faced here to, with two different scenarios. In a scenario A, there are large intergroup variations and there is a small difference in between the groups. So we will need to develop an assay that performs with high accuracy and low variation to be able to detect the difference in between these two groups. In contrast, in the scenario B, we have minimal intergroup variation for both groups, but there is a large difference in between the groups. So an assay to detect this difference can uh, perform with high variation and lower accuracy. Understanding this is important so that you know where to put your, your assets and, and where to spend time and assets, yes, uh, so that it, you find a cost-effective solution. So now we want to uh, tell you about real life challenges that we have encountered through our customers. And we will discuss this uh, and the solutions given through different case studies. So different things that can ha happen is like, no issues are observed during analytical validation, but problems are raised during clinical analysis. I uh, don't know if you have encountered that problem, but that can typically happen. And it's important to, to find a rapid solution, of course, so the development can continue in a timely manner. Development of a robust assay for an unstable biomarker is often a challenge too. And that unreliable data is obtained because of lack of analyte understanding. This is important and not many times is not understood. Fit for purpose analysis for newly developed drugs and formulations can also be difficult to, to find a solution for. We also encounter, and you perhaps have also encountered that the context of use of, of your data changes during the drug development process or of your biomarker changes during the drug development process. And often we also ask for finding both accurate and high throughput fit for purpose solutions. So I will soon pass the word to my colleagues, the scientists here with me, so that they can uh, go through the first four challenges here. But before that, I want to introduce another poll question so that you we can understand what is the biggest bioanalytical challenge for you. Thank you very much, Carmen. So as with the previous poll, uh, attendees can select on more than one option and then click submit. The question we're asking is, what is your biggest bioanalysis challenge? Your answer options are finding the right technical solution, understanding context of use, understanding the regulatory demands, or other. We'll give everyone some time to consider your answers. Please select Again, as many that you feel apply to you, and then click Submit in order to participate in this poll. Question is, once more, what is your biggest bioanalysis challenge? We're all much faster at this. Thank you so much. Let's look at your results for this one. We have 85% of you selecting finding the right technical solution, 62% of you selecting understanding the regulatory demands, 31% for understanding context of use. So thank you again very much for your participation. Um, Carmen, I'm handing it back to you. Yes, and uh, you can hear us properly, I guess. Yes. Yes, just as a checkup. And it's uh, great. So we hope we can, find, we can help you now uh, with uh, going through different technical solutions that we can define so you can understand that better. And you can always, of course, come back with more questions. I hand the word to Tanya. Thank you, Carmen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we will start with the first uh, case study, uh, and it uh, is about issues uh, that we saw during our clinical analysis. Uh, so, the background was uh, that we had a commercial assay that we had validated for use as a PK assay. Uh, there was no issues uh, during the validation. And also, uh, during the first part of the clinical study, everything looked okay. But this was a, a very long study, so we had to buy uh, new plate lots. 
and then surprisingly there was uh, issues uh, because there was a lot to lot variation. Uh, the, the, we saw um, a lot of uh, variation within the plate uh, and there was also false positive results in pre-dose samples. And these samples, is a, since it is a PK assay, they have not been in contact with the dose, so they should not con contain any, any um, uh, concentration of the drug. Uh, this needed a, a rapid solution to be able to conduct the clinical development as planned and obtain reliable data that could be used for decision making. And here is uh, one example uh, that shows uh, uh, one of the PREDO samples, uh, and it, uh, the response uh, from the PREDO sample is between calibrator 2 and 3, so it's uh, a measurable concentration. Uh, yes, and what should we do <laughs> now? Uh, we could uh, try to, to redevelop the assay, optimize it, or we could try to find a, a, a plate from another vendor. Uh, but all this would take too long time uh, and all changes also need to be validated and, and that would not uh, fit into the time plane of, uh, uh, of the project. So we have to find a, a short term solution for this. Uh, so uh, we used only part of the plate and I will show that on the, on the next slide. And we needed to do a blank subtraction with the pre-dose samples, and, and we uh, validated that with the spike recovery experiments. Uh, for a long-term solution to the, to the next uh, clinical study, we suggested uh, uh, several different solutions. And uh, one of them was that we could use, uh, we could coat the plates and use uh, our in-house knowledge uh, and uh, about uh, a coating plates since we have uh, 30 years experience of uh, developing kits and producing kits and also the services. So um, that would solve the uh, issues with um, uh, high variation within the plate and a lot to lot variation. Uh, we also suggested the use of uh, Mercodia proprietary buffer to reduce, reduce the background in the pre-dose samples. Here is what the plate uh, looked like. So um, the commercial, uh, the external commercial plate, it, as you see, it, there's a high variation within, in the plate, 13.1%. There are clear edge effects. Uh, and, and you compare, compare to the uh, Mercodia coated plate with the same uh, antibody. Uh, and there's a much lower CV. In the external commercial plate, there is clear edge effect, uh, and you can imagine that depending on where you put your sample on this plate, you will get different results. And uh, actually, it was uh, that um, the QC samples, uh, then they, uh, depending on the, where they were positioned, uh, they uh, one, were not within the acceptance criteria, and we had to do a lot of reruns. Approximately 25% of the uh, plates needed to be rerun, and that is not, of course, cost effective. And also, if the pre dose samples are, are positioned in the edge of this plate, then um, they will ha have high concentration, and, and that is not a false positive response. So, so the short term solution, as I said, was that we could not use the whole plate. Uh, we removed uh, row A and H, so we used only, uh, re we removed 25% of the positions in the plate, that can, uh, and that meant that we could not, um, uh, could, we could not have so many samples in each plate, so there needed to be more runs, so, so that is not a, a good uh, long-term solution, but in the short term we, we had to do that. And in the long term, we will use the Mercodia plate, and then, then we can use the whole plate for, for samples. So, um, then if we look at um, here, it's the same result from the commercial plate that we looked at uh, previously with the pre dose samples giving a measurable concentration. On the Mercodia coated plate, uh, the, the response uh, that we got is below calibrator one. And calibrator one is the lower limit of quantification. So this pre dose sample don't have a measurable concentration. That is the way it should be. Uh, looking at more um, 
uh, uh, Predo sample, it was also obvious that we in a, we, we must use, not only use the Mercudia coated plate, but also our proprietary buffer. Here is um, seven different uh, Predo samples, and in the original method, uh, uh, only two of them were below uh, the lower limit of quantification. But with the Mercudia coated plate and, and buffer, all of them were below the lower limit of quantification. So the Mercudia coated plate and buffer solved the issue with the false positive predose samples. So um, the, the improvements that we have done uh, was that we minimize the risk of false positive in the relevant matrix, so we will get reliable data. Uh, we have low lot to lot variability and high interplate homogeneity, so it will be a highly robustness over time and fewer runs and reruns required, and that will be cost and time effective. Uh, so the overall value will be uh, cost saving, 25% reduction of uh, per price sample, uh, sample price, uh, and the cost effective, 30% faster time to result. It's a, a stable method with good data control and reliability valid for different clinical phases. So the status right now is that the sponsor has successfully completed their first first in human PK study, and we are happy that we could help with that. And now uh, uh, the optimized and validated assay with Mercodia plates and buffer will be used for the clinical phase two. Uh, and we will do a cross validation between these two different uh, studies to, to show that they give the, the same results. So now we go to case study number two. And here we developed an um, assay for an unstable biomarker. Uh, the background was that there was a need of an assay for measurement of glucagon on 34,000 human plasma samples uh, collected in a type two di diabetes study. And the samples were collected over a long period of time and they were to be analyzed in many different labs. So there was a need of a robust assay over time. Uh, and this, uh, despite that glucagon is being unstable in plasma. Uh, there was also a need of a high specificity since there are many endogenous homologous uh, peptides. Uh, the, the approach and the suggestion from Mercodi here was to using a surrogate matrix for the calibrators and quality controls, and since the glucagon is not stable uh, in uh, plasma for, for long times. Uh, and uh, also since it's, um, it, uh, there is not possible to find a bl blank matrix since uh, glucagon is always present there, so, so you, it's difficult to use uh, plasma for to, to prepare the calibrators. Uh, provide, uh, we could also provide sample collection and preservation advice. And uh, actually on the on Mercodia's uh, homepage, you can find a, a technical note uh, over 14 pages with uh, uh, advices how to collect sample and uh, preserve them with, with glucagon. Yeah. And also we have done a, a very careful selection of critical radiants uh, for minimal cross-reactivity with the endogenous homologous peptides. Um, using a, a, a parallelism experiment is, is always uh, important when you work with a biomarker, but it's especially important uh, when you use a, a surrogate uh, matrix for the calibrators. Uh, and in this parallelism experiment, we have um, different plasma samples with different levels of glucagon, and they are serial diluted. And then if we plot uh, the, uh, the concentrations from the, from, uh, and the relative error from the different dilutions, uh, you can see that all of them are within the acceptance criteria. So this shows that there is a parallelism between the synthetic glucagon in the surrogate matrix uh, compared to, to the endogenous glucagon in the plasma samples. And now we go to, to how to choose antibodies with high specificity. 
At uh, Mercodia, we use surface plasmon resonance and, and BIACOR instruments to, to choose antibodies. And I will give you a, sh a brief introduction to surface plasmon resonance. And you, you immobilize uh, one of your binding partners on a sensor surface, and then you inject uh, the other binding partner. Uh, and you can study the binding in, in real time uh, as an increase in response. And then you stop injecting the sample and instead start to inject just buffer and you can follow the dissociation. And by looking at the association rate and dissociation rate, you can calculate the kinetics and also the affinity of the binding between the two molecules. Uh, in our case here with glucagon, uh, we had uh, immobilized rabbit and mouse IgG on the sensor surface. Um, and then we have um, captured mouse anti-glucagon antibodies. And we study uh, the binding to, to glucagon. Uh, and here we also can uh, study the binding with other peptides that are homologous to, to glucagon. Uh, here you can see the sequence of glucagon and also the sequence of a, a shorter the, the glucagon 3 to 29 uh, and pro glucagon glycentine and oxyntomodulin and all of them share the same sequence so it's very difficult to get specific antibodies that recognize only glucagon and, and not the other peptides here uh, here we have one antibody uh, that we have uh, uh, we have done epitope mapping, so we know that it binds to the end terminus of uh, glucagon. Uh, and when we do this uh, uh, surface plasmon resonance, uh, uh, look at the sensogram here, we uh, inject different concentration of glucagon. And then we have the dissociation here. It's a stable binding. Uh, it's a, we look at the dissociation during 50 minutes has a, a high affinity, a low value here means a high affinity. If you compare with the glucagon 3 to 29, uh, which we don't want to measure, uh, it does also bind to the antibody, but it has a very fast dissociation. So you can imagine here that uh, this uh, gl glucagon 3 to 29 will be washed away in the washing step in an in ELISA. It's not a stable binding. Uh, it's similar with proglucagon and glycentine. They also have a, a very fast dissociation. Oxyntomodulin, on the other hand, uh, it binds also very stable uh, with comparable affin sim similar affinity as uh, glucagon. And uh, both oxyntomodulin and glucagon has this, exactly the same sequence in the end terminus. So to be able to use uh, this antibody, in an ELISA that should be specific for glucagon, then we also need to combine it with another antibody uh, that can um, distinguish between uh, glucagon and oxyntomodulin. So then we need an antibody here in the C-terminus sequence. And here is such an antibody. Uh, and here is the sensorgram showing the binding between glucagon and, and this antibody. And it has, has an extremely high uh, affinity and uh, very, very stable binding, almost, almost no dissociation at all. Uh, Oxyntomodulin, uh, here you can see a clear dissociation and the affinity is much lower. So by using these two antibodies, in a, one as a capture and the other as a detect antibody in the sandwich ELISA format, uh, could give a specificity uh, for glucagon. And here you see the, that we have uh, no detectable uh, cross-reactivity or very, very low cross-reactivity to glycentin, oxyntomodulin, or proglucagon and, and glucagon 3 to 29. Uh, so we also have, since this is an asset that was going to be used or during a long time, I wanted to show you this picture that shows that uh, we have is, uh, using the, the glucagon ELISA, uh, you will get the same results 
over many years, and here is from year 2014 uh, and it's 2020. And you see that there's very robust uh, response really concentration uh, that is measured during the year. So even if you need to, to buy a new lot, you will, can expect the same uh, uh, concentrations uh, that will be measured. So the overall value that we could provide uh, provide is uh, high specificity with minimal cross reactivity to homologous peptides, high robustness. We have more than three years shelf life for the kit, and also if you if you must uh, buy a new lot, there there's a low lot to lot variability. We have high accuracy, uh, plus minus 10 percent uh, for um, all quality controls. And we can give sample collection and preservation advice. So the status right now is that Mercodia glucagon ELISA was successfully used to measure glucagon on these 34,000 human plasma samples in this uh, type 2 diabetes uh, multi-site clinical study. And it's um, a rather famous study in, in the diabetes uh, field. And you can see the reference for, for the study there. So now I come to case study number three, uh, that there was a lack of comprehensive understanding of the analyte. So the need here was that the sponsor uh, needed a PK assay for measurement of a drug candidate in a preclinical studies in monkey and in rat. Uh, they have turned to one zero, uh, and they had issues with uh, uh, there was no dilution in unity when they did the, the validation. And you can see uh, the plot here. That the blue line is the expected results, uh, since you expect if you you expect to measure the same concentration as is the nominal concentration in your samples. But the lines in the other colors are what they got when they did dilution linearity. So they dilute from, from high concentration and, and measure what concentration they get. And in this region, they measure two times too much uh, of the drug. And in, in this uh, region, they get the uh, measured concentration that are four times too high. So there was a lack of dilution like linearity. The second zero that tried to develop the assay, uh, they prepared uh, calibrators in uh, monkey plasma. Uh, and uh, so they spike the drug into monkey plasma. And you can see here that in unspiked plasma, the, the blank plasma, they have a high uh, response, 0.5. Uh, uh, and this plasma is uh, actually diluted 200 times. So it's a very high response. Um, and there's a bad separation between the blank and, and the lower concentrations. These zeros, they, they worked on this assay for, for more than one year, uh, but, but could not solve these issues. Um, there was also another challenge, and that was the commercial assay that was used. Uh, the, it was a large so sample volume that, that was needed, so that doesn't uh, make it suitable if you use, um, will use it in, uh, in studies that are a limited amount of plasma. So all these challenges needs to be solved to be able to continue with the preclinical studies. And now uh, I would like to take put up a text here that is from uh, 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 a guideline uh, from the regulatory uh, agencies that's about biolithic method validation. Uh, and uh, they encourage uh, that one should, if feasible, understand the analyte of interest for example, the physical chemical properties of the drug, in vitro and vivo metabolism, prefer preferential distribution between red blood cells and plasma protein binding and so. And uh, as a zero, we, we usually don't have a, a thorough understanding of the analytes, uh, uh, but since each analyte is unique, uh, but the sponsor, they have a lot of, uh, usually uh, a lot of uh, knowledge about their drug. So then there is a, a need to have a, it's very important to have good communication between the sponsor and, and the CRO so we can transfer uh, this knowledge. 
it's also important to have a relevant scientific expertise and have time to do some background research uh, before starting the development of a bioanalytical method. Uh, here, uh, this analyte, this drug, uh, it's a recombinant human protein. And this protein, it's normally present in, 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 in normal plasma that, uh, with less than 10 nanograms per milliliter. But if uh, it, it is released from red blood cells and platelets during cell damage and inflammation in the body, also uh, uh, if uh, the red blood cells or platelets become uh, damaged uh, during uh, uh, collection of the samples or during storage of the samples, then this molecule will be released and you will have uh, much higher concentrations. And, and we speculate that maybe what, that what had happened with the monkey plasma for the, the second zero. So the, the, the important thing here is that the quality of the samples will influence the quality of the assay results. Uh, so here we, um, without any requests from the sponsor, we could give recommendations to the study protocol uh, since we realized that this was important for for the success of the project. So we recommended the platelet depleted plasma sample. Then we did some modification of, of this commercial kit. Uh, we prepared standard and QC with the drug candidate. Uh, we used buffer matrix in the standard uh, and we justified that with parallelism experience, experiments, uh, just as we described previously for, for glucagon. And, and the reason for using a buffer matrix here is uh, one, that it's uh, difficult to, to obtain a plasma with, that doesn't contain any uh, of this uh, endogenous protein since it's, um, uh, yes, it, it, since it's endogenous. And also since we want to, to use as little anim, animal as possible. Uh, the QC uh, were prepared in plasma from monkey. We could also, by modification, uh, decrease the volume needed. Uh, so you, the sample volume. So instead of 200 microliter, we could only use 16 microliter. And that makes it more suitable for use for small animal. Uh, during the validation, we saw that there was lot to lot variation, uh, so we uh, decided to use a single lot in the study. So we, before starting the, the sample analysis, we have to buy a, a lot of, of uh, ELISA kit. Uh, we uh, did a full bioanalytical validation for measurements in, in monkey plasma, and all uh, the different experiments were within acceptance criteria. Uh, also, the dilution linearity uh, that did not work so good for the first uh, zero. Uh, then we did sample analysis uh, in a monkey. We did modification of the kit to measure in rat plasma. We did a partial validation, and then we did sample analysis in rat study. So the overall value that we could give was a recommendation about species sample collection uh, so that they could get the correct data. Uh, we uh, used buffer matrix in the calibrators to re reduce animal use and improve the assay. We lowered the sample volume to make it suitable also for studies with limited amount of plasma. Uh, we solved the dilution linearity issues unsolved by previous zero and we have a stable method with good uh, data control and reliability valid for different uh, preclinical studies. So now I hand over to Dan. Thank you, Tanya. So I will present the last case presented in this webinar. And this is about measuring drug functionality in new formulations. So in this case, uh, the sponsor uh, have uh, um, want to reformulate commercial drugs using atomic layer deposition. So they cover the drug with a, a metal coat <clears throat> uh, and they wanted to know if this process or the dissolution of the coat may damage the drug. So the goals were to investigate the integrity of two different drugs 
uh, during the formulation process and the dissolution of the coat. And for the second drug, they also want to do some PK analysis in rat plant plasma and biopsies. So we face different challenges in this case, as different drugs might require different fit for purpose solutions. And also during the conversation with the sponsor, we realized that maybe studying just the integrity of the drug was not enough. And uh, it might be more interesting for them actually to study the functionality of the drug. So for the first drug was a peptide and we suggest three different approaches, all of them based on SPR. In the first case will be a direct measure uh, of the uh, peptide uh, using specific antibodies where the integrity will be checked but not the functionality. Uh, in the second approach, we will use the same antibody, but we will add uh, the receptor to the drug so that uh, the functionality of the peptide will be assessed. In the third approach, uh, similar to the second one, we will uh, bind the receptor to the surface, check the functionality of the peptide, and then uh, use a specific antibody to check the integrity. It was important to do a risk assessment of the different approaches. For instance, we realized that the solvent used to dissolve the, the code might interfere with the biocore system. Also that the receptor for the drug might not bind the, the drug and that might be an issue during the uh, recombinant production of the, of the receptor. So issues with the conformation or it might be that the receptor is not possible to mobilize in the chip. So the solutions that we presented to the sponsor were to use alternative solvents uh, that can be analyzed, all of them, and they agreed that they can use different solvents that don't contain uh, uh, components that interfere with the biocore system. We also decided to use several suppliers products uh, for the receptor no, it's just one and look for uh, some receptors that have been functionalized or investigated that they functioned as uh, in binding the, the drug. Uh, and also we suggest to use a receptor that has a TAC modification so that we can use this TAC for immobilization. With all that, uh, we allow the, the sponsor to have uh, to make an informed decision. And in this case, they decide to go for approach number three with the modification that I just mentioned, where we will use an anti-tag antibody to bind the receptor to the, to the surface. In the case of drug number two, it was an humanized antibody. And we suggest two different approaches. In this case, one is based on SPR and uh, while well, the second one is based on ELISA. For the first approach, uh, the integrity will be checked by uh, binding to an anti-human IgG and to the antigen, and also the, uh, and the functional analysis, sorry, will be uh, validated by binding to the antigen. Nevertheless, as they wanted to do some PK analysis later on on, this, on the project, we suggest that on ELISA base, can be uh, of better use. And in this case, the antigen will be caught to the surface of the well, while the drug will be bind an anti-IgG, uh, anti-human IgG use for detection. In this, uh, with this uh, approach, we will also check first the functional analysis of the uh, drug and then the integrity of it. Again, we did a risk assessment where we find out that the antigen will be difficult to detect in SPR as it's a very small molecule. Uh, and that also uh, affects uh, the use of a direct ELISA instead of a sandwich ELISA. So because such a small molecule will be difficult to have two different antibodies that bind to it. Also the source of antigen can be uh, can bring problems as they might behave differently depending on the supplier. So the, uh, what we suggest was to use an ELISA-based method as an alternative to SPR. Uh, 
and use several, several suppliers for the, for the antigen to be investigated and to make sure that which one works better. As I mentioned, the sponsor decided that yeah, the LISA based approach will be uh, a good option for the uh, needs. And later on, uh, they will do some PK analysis. So we divide the project into uh, toll gates. So in the first uh, toll gates, uh, the drug will be analyzed uh, and if the method works, they can decide to go ahead or stop. Uh, then we will do an optimization of the process uh, where different coating conditions might be studied or we will prepare a calibration curve, LLOQ determination and so on. Uh, then a validation phase and finally a non-clinical analysis on plasma samples and biopsies. And with this toll case stop and go, we bring, uh, we give flexibility to the sponsor to decide whether or not to continue depending on the results. So the overall value was a tailored bioanalytical solution to study drug functionality. So we give expert solutions to imp for improved outcomes and assets optimization. So we detect the, the customer's needs. Uh, we also did a risk assessment basis, uh, risk assessment basis solutions, and that give to the sponsor reliable data and minimize risks. And um, by adding stop go toll gates, uh, the project is flexible and cost efficient. And um, with that, I pass the word to my colleague Carmen. So thank you, Yanni. And now we have gone through very diverse um, fit for purpose or tailored solutions to address many different challenges within the bioanalytical space. These are real life, uh, real life solutions that our expert team of scientists have worked on. And uh, with that, I would like to draw some of our conclusions, that is that understanding the analyte the regulatory demands, the intended use of the data and the specific context of use is really essential when designing your bioanalytical strategy. And this is of course key to guarantee the most important thing that is that the right, right data is obtained at the right time at all stages so the right decisions can be taken. And this sits at the basis of asset optimization and risk management, management sorry, for the drug development process. If you have any questions, we will address them now, but we will be happy to collaborate with you if you have any deeper needs uh, uh, for bio your bioanalysis. So feel free to contact us and Mercolia. We are happy to collaborate with you. You can find us here in the webpage. And before we take questions, we will have one more poll question to understand if you are looking for bioanalytical partner. Yes, thank you so much. Appearing on everyone's screen is our final poll question before we get into the Q&A. Just wondering, are you looking for a bioanalysis partner? Your answer options are simply a yes, a no, or I don't know. In a moment, we'll hear from our speakers and start answering some of the questions that you've submitted. Um, for now, though, let's just take a moment to just ask, are you looking for a bioanalysis partner? Everyone here attending, a few moments to consider your answer. Then in a moment, we will get into our Q&A. Looks like most of you have submitted your answers, so thank you very much for participating. Looks like we have 83% of you selecting no and then 17% selecting yes, so thank you very much for participating. We hope those that you've still gotten something out of this wonderful presentation. Now though, I would like to invite our audience to continue sending your questions or comments for this Q&A session of the webinar. I've already received some questions for our speakers, so we'll get ourselves started with those. Looking here, our very first question that we have for you um, is wondering, so if you have done a full validation in one species, what would you include in a partial validation for using the assay in another species? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can take that. Um, it, it First of all, it depends on the 
the context of use and, and the intended use of the data. For example, if, is it an exploratory study or, or is it a, a, should the data be used for regulatory decision making? But um, as, uh, at least we would do look at accuracy and precision in, in this new species. Uh, and maybe not in three runs, it could be enough within, uh, no, maybe not in six runs, maybe it's yet enough in, in, with eight runs. And then um, we would also look at uh, selectivity in this new species, uh, uh, so, so the new matrix doesn't uh, influence the, the results. Uh, if it's a biomarker, then we would uh, clearly look at parallelism uh, in the, this new matrix. And for um, if it's a uh, different uh, concentrations that are, is expected in, in the study, then we will have to look at dilution linearity again. And stability in, in this matrix may also be important to, to look at. Thanks. All right, very good. Thank you for that mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. um, the next question would like to know, so when do you use a surrogate matrix um, to the calibrators and why? Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we uh, used, as you saw, we used it in the two of the case studies. Uh, and um, the, the, there can be different uh, things that uh, may, make it uh, necessary to use a surrogate matrix. For example, if it's an, an endogenous uh, uh, substance, then uh, it's not possible to find a blank matrix uh, without uh, the molecule. Uh, the other could be that if the analyte is not stable in, in the matrix, uh, as for the glucagon example. And then it's also important to, in EU there is a law that you should use, uh, try not to use animal uh, serum, but if you can replace it with, with other things. So, so to reduce the use of animal, that's also one reason for, for using a surrogate matrix. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much for that answer. Um, the next question is curious, in case study one, did you use the same study population during validation as in the clinical study? Yes, uh, we did, uh, but even so we got problems with the pre-dose samples. So, so as recommended in, in guidelines, if possible, one, one should try to use the, the same uh, population both during the, the validation as in, this, in the study. Very interesting, thank you. The next question wonders, how does the process for starting a service project with Mercodia just look like? Mm. So maybe I can tell you yeah. that this. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> That's of course very important. We understand that, uh, as you saw also in this presentation, all projects are very different from each other. So what is very important to our clients is usually to have a tailored solution. And when we say a tailored solution, it's both a tailor in a technical way, but it's also tailored to their specific needs in timeline, in, in accessibility and so on. So we have, we, we package it in different ways. And Jan, for example, uh, showed that we have stop and goes to make it fl flexible. But what we do to define that is that uh, there is an initial uh, contact, right? And then we try to, to have a second meeting where we involve our expert team early because we, we understand that for our customers, it's important to have um, a deep understanding of the project need from an early stage so they can have a really a real solution that really fits them. So we do that and in that initial meeting, one or two meetings, we define the scope, we define the intended use and the regulatory demands perhaps that can apply and with that we define a working project for, together and offer. Uh, that is tailored with stop and goes. It can have sometimes some some small consultancy package, initial package, so that the project can be understood uh, in depth, which is uh, often a need we have seen. And then we we have um, yeah we go through the stop and goes with reliable data so that they can take informed decisions 
to proceed on the project or or withdraw if if uh, that is fitting them better and uh, and at the end that is through the through the project phase of course and at the end of the project there's usually some kind of reporting and closure of the project involved yes so there is flexibility that is, this is what it is important we think uh, and there are many instances we define what are the instances for for taking decisions and potentially even modifying the project oh, all right we wonderful try thank to you collaborate uh, with, yeah. so that uh, it is a collaboration no oh, yeah that's that's wonderful it's very important i think um so uh, I suppose, though, at this point, you know, thank you very much for that answer and for all of the answers. However, we have reached the end of our time here today. Now, if we can attend to all of your questions, the team at Mercodia will follow up with you. Or if you have some further questions, you can direct them to the email addresses that are up on your screen. I want to thank everyone, though, for participating in today's webinar. You will be receiving a follow up email from Xtalks with access to the recorded archive for this event. A survey window will be popping up on your screen as you exit and your participation is appreciated as it will help us to improve our webinars. Now I've also sent you all a link in the chat box and with this link you'll be able to view the recording of this event on this page and you can also share this link with your colleagues so they may view the recording once they register as well. So I encourage you to do that. Now please join me once more in thanking all of our speakers for their wonderful time here today. We hope that you all found the webinar informative. Have a great day everyone and thank you for coming.